Good evening and welcome to the April 9th school committee meeting. This meeting is being recorded by East Hampton Media. Dr. LeClaire. Good evening. Could we start please by standing for a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the next regular school committee meetings will be on April 23rd, May 14th, May 28th, and June 11th, 2019. There is no school April 15th through the 19th due to Patriots Day and spring break. There's a half day of school on Friday, May 3rd due to Teachers Professional Development Day. There's no school on Monday, May 27th due to Memorial Day and the last day of school is currently scheduled for Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of the members of the school building councils that met for a joint meeting recently for the purpose of reviewing and making revisions to the updated bullying prevention plan. The plan is currently on the district website and is open for community and family input. After vacation, the plan will be finalized and then it will be permanently placed on the district website. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any correspondence? We do. We have um, a letter that came to us from the members of the Gender and Sexua Sexuality Alliance at the high school, and it's very brief, so I'll just read it. Um, Dear school committee, the members of the Gender and Sexuality Alliance at East Hampton High School would like to say thank you for supporting us by approving our recent trip to the True Colors Conference. We attended on Friday, March 22nd. Traveling to the University of Connecticut in Storrs, Connecticut was a big deal for most of us. Navigating the college campus to get to and from the workshops that we attended required us to work as a team to support each other. We developed deeper friendships within our GSA and with students from around New England. We hope to make this an annual event and appreciate your support. And then um, lots of signatures from the members of that alliance. Great. And then we also have um, a correspondence that came from um, our teacher, Gerard Benoit, who I believe is here to give us a presentation today. Yes. And this correspondence was giving us some background on the um, cultural immersion program and asking for permission to present today, so. Okay. Yes, do we want to have Gerard come up now or are we going to wait for public speak? I think we we're going to do Okay, we'll do it in public yeah. speak, perfect. Um, do we have gifts? No gifts this evening. Okay. So now it's the time for public speak. Is there anyone who would like to come up and say anything? Okay. Madam Chair, yes. if I may just have the floor for a yes. couple of minutes. Um, I would like to introduce um, my mayor of the day, uh, Julian Sadler Sand. Duncan. Sadler Duncan. Sand. Sand. Do you want to say in the microphone? Sand. Sand. Yeah. Sand or Duncan. Dun Sand or Duncan. Um, <laughs> and we spent the afternoon together. I went to his school. To, to center school and do you want to just come to the mic and quickly say what we talked about in the ordinance? Um, oh, uh, about uh, extra um, 40 minutes of recess because it's uh, good for like exercise and uh, for, for brain and I hope that was his idea. It, oh, yeah. yes, it, it absolutely was. <laughs> and uh, we presented it to the ordinance subcommittee of city council for further consideration. It was referred to this body by Chair Salem Derby for joint consideration. So Fantastic. just wanted wow. to report out. Thank it's you for great. the opportunity. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot of extra <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Gonna watch out, Mayor. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> no lowering the voting age or, or, or yeah. Well, I'm going to have to see what happens when signature time comes. <laughs> so now it's time for our presentations. Do you want to introduce? So, yes, so I'll go in the order that yep. we have them yep. here. Our first presentation tonight is a group that has come back to this committee to share with you some survey results. It's the SAD group who was here recently, I think two weeks ago. When, when were they here? A month, three months. Yeah. Already? yeah. 
and um, they came and presented some information on condom availability at the high school and they shared with us that evening that they were putting forth a survey and they wanted to come back and share the results with us so ladies if you'd like to come up to the microphone and tell us what you have learned welcome hi would you introduce Hello. yourselves um, my name is Aisha Okatan. I'm a junior at East Hampton High. And I'm Jessica Hamilton, and I'm a sophomore. We are here t tonight to provide you guys with the result of the condom survey given to the students. But keep in mind that 98% of the students who took the survey took it seriously. The first question, do you think condoms should be available in school? 89% of the people who took the survey said yes. Do you think condoms in school would increase sexual activity? 82% said no. Do you think having condoms in school would increase protective sex for sexually active students? 91 said yes. Some of the comments that we put together were from the surveys and they said it promotes safe sexual activity even for people who haven't done it and when they do they know that they should use one. Um, if we don't have condoms people are going to end up with kids and diseases. It makes kids safe. It should be a priority. And it is good to let kids know that they're there. And more condoms available will encourage safety. And they are easy to get, they aren't easy to get outside of school and it would provide safe sex. And we have a few questions about the about letter to send home to your parents, but we have them written down. Oh. So I can do they're bringing the questions to the chair. Great. Because they know during public speak that's not a time for yep. exchange of discourse. So I told them that so we'll you, them you, would, yeah, you yep. would review them and then get back to them. Okay. So ladies, is it the recommendation of the SAD group that we move forward with the condom distribution for next year? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming back and sharing that information with us. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Can we get a copy of those results? Could we get a copy of the results, ladies? I can give you the scripts. Great. That would be great. If you don't mind. <laughs> okay, we'll share it with <laughs> everybody. Later. Thank you. Do you have a copy of it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then we also have um, Mr. Gerard Benoit, who is the um, one of the foreign language teachers up at the high school, and he is here this evening just to give us an overview of the French exchange yep. program. Good evening, thank you for Good coming. evening and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Gerard Benoit, as she says, and I teach English and French at the high school. And we are just about to start the third exchange with our partner school in Châtelain, France, the uh, Lycée Saint-Louis. At this moment, um, I've got a group of 15 students who have already sent their letters of introduction to, to us and I'm trying uh, to find host families for these students. But I come before you today not so much for the hosting part of the exchange, but for the, the traveling part. Um, it's an exchange uh, where we would take in a student and then um, say, for example, I hosted a student from France. I would go then to that student's family. So it's a, it's a family exchange. And so um, we're hoping that we're going to have 15 students who are hosting who could then actually go to France in return for the true exchange experience. And how long is that um, exchange for? So um, hosting and traveling is about two weeks long. So when they come here, for it's roughly two weeks, a little less for the French. When we go there, it's just shy of two weeks. It's like 13 days. And it takes place um, during April vacation. Um, half of it is during April vacation. Okay. So you, are you currently trying to find host families for this coming up April vacation? Is that yes. Okay. Well, actually, the so right. So when we host, they they come in October. So they're coming in October of this coming school year, and then we in turn will go to them in in April. Next. And ideally people that host would also travel, but it hasn't worked out that way um, since I've been here. So um, 
I'm, I'm really hoping to get 15 people who can host and travel, but it's not too likely, I, I don't suppose. So I think that this committee is, uh, will be asked at the next school committee meeting to vote on approving this exchange program. Okay. And the implications for the district are it's, it's funded by students, um, but then it just requires a Right, there's not a financial, yeah, there's not a right. financial. This might be three or commitment. four days that students who don't travel are without the, the full-time teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank you. I have tonight. some uh, information uh, if you needed it to help the decision, such as uh, cost, um, an example itinerary of what we've received in the past. I think that um, would be helpful. As, yeah. as well as an itinerary that we've put forward for the sake of comparison. Um, and, and I have several copies. I don't know if you want one or several or how you feel about that. But I think you can give it to Sue and yeah. she'll okay. make sure that we have it for the next meeting. Sure. Perfect. Mm. I have a scrapbook if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was wondering if you also had no, remarks no, of students who have participated before. Yes, I mean, um, this is not your typical travel mm -hmm. uh, program. This is really a learning program. Um, it's cultural immersion. Um, when I started the program like 14 years ago, it was really about language acquisition. Uh, but given that our community is as small as it is, um, we don't have the students and friends to support that. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, we decided for an exchange program, not necessarily a French exchange. Um, ideally, every other year we'd be doing a trip to, uh, well, France and then a Spanish-speaking country. Um, I've attempted to put together um, a trip to a Spanish-speaking country, but um, due to lack of interest, it didn't move forward. Um, so um, it's about language acquisition, but really, lately it's been more about culture, um, about learning who you are, learning about your own culture, but through somebody else's. Um, it's an opportunity that students don't really get after they graduate from high school um, because you're really taken into the family as part of the family. Mm -hmm. And while you could go to college, say, um, and travel and even be in a host family, you're never given the access that you do as a, as a minor, as, as a student. Um, and if it's a real exchange where I send my child to your house, right, and you send your child to my house, it creates some, some serious bonds. And so uh, I'm trying to sell to students the idea of an opportunity to travel abroad, to learn about themselves, to learn about their culture, to improve their language ability perhaps in the target language, an opportunity for a friend for life, um, and not just for the students themselves, but even their families. Um, and there are some students who say, well, I, I, I'd love to host, but I can't travel right now. You know, the, the consolation prize isn't too small in that, well, great, you can host now and then later you're almost guaranteed to always have a place to go uh, if ever you're traveling in that part of the world. So there's really a lot more to this than traveling, not to mention at the community level. Um, among the things that you know we do when they come here is we bring them out about in public transportation, for example, and we're, they're talking to people that live here and we really kind of go about, you know, in our local communities as we do when we are in France. So um, this is more than just uh, an exchange between students, between families. Um, our sister school really looks to us as being uh, a partner, and so to our communities. Well, you don't have to convince me. My exchange <laughs> changed my whole life, but I was just wondering if students who participated from East Hampton actually made some comments that were published and that could help to expand this program. That's yes, well, um, well, in the way of published, um, I had some students interviewed, I believe it was the last exchange they were on, they were interviewed on public ac access, mm -hmm. um, so you may wish to go and, and look at that. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, um, the Gazette did an article the too, Gazette, a couple of we them, have, I think. Yep, several write-ups and, and articles. I've had students come back to me uh, to say, you know, Monsieur, I cannot believe I was this close to saying 
uh, yeah, this isn't really for me. I don't really want to travel. The idea of being in somebody's home is kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> my parents don't like foreigners. I don't want to have to take somebody in. I was this close to saying no to the exchange, uh, but he kind of twisted my arm. And thank goodness, because I got into the program that I got into, or I got a job working for the State Department because of this, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think those comments would be very helpful yeah. to help expand the program. So thank you. And you could borrow my book. <laughs> and is it just for ninth to twelfth graders? Is that what the for the, the ninth to twelve? Ninth to twelve. Cool. We're still in contact with all our girls. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now our student update. So at the high school right now, um, 9th, 10th, and 11th graders are going through course registration. Today, the 9th graders went, and tomorrow's the 10th graders. And then on Thursday, 11th graders are going to be picking their classes for next year. Um, the World Language Club is going to Guatemala and Belize for April break. Um, the seniors went on the Credit for Life field trip last Thursday, which went very well. And also, Mr. East Hampton was last Friday, and that went very well. And that's all I have. Excellent. Thank you. Subcommittee reports. Finance subcommittee. We have not met since the last meeting. Okay. Now let's see. We yes, we have a lot. Um, first, just to follow up um, from our SAD presentation, we did look together at some sample policies from other districts in Massachusetts related to condom distribution, and we um, made some minor adjustments to an existing policy and sent it to our district lawyer who took a look and said that it looked legally sound. So um, we asked the superintendent to share this draft policy with the SAD group, and that way we could get some student feedback, and then we will be bringing it to the full committee at some point for review. Um, we also have quite a few first readings, so um, I will thank you in advance for your patience. Um, I will try to go through these as quickly as I can, but please feel free to like stop me, and we can talk about more if you want to talk further about any of them. Um, but the first two are uh, related to, um, well, there's tobacco products on school premises prohibited. This is an MASC policy that we do not currently have on the books. So uh, we are recommending um, to accept as a, the first reading of um, ADC, tobacco products on school premises prohibited. Okay, so you've made a motion. Do we have a second? second. Do we have any discussion? Do you want to group them all together? No. We asked if we oh, could. Oh, too many. And we okay. too tried many. that. <laughs> Good Me. thinking, though. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Uh, next is the drug free workplace policy, which also um, is an MASC existing policy that we do not currently have. So I would make a motion to accept for first reading GBEC drug free workplace policy. Second. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Up next, we have um, student activity accounts, file JJF. Um, this is, again, an MASC policy that we do not have on the books. We had this reviewed by Dale Doran to make sure that it was consistent with the procedures that we use in the business office. So I would make a motion to accept as first reading um, JJF. Second. Second. OK, discussion? All those in favor? Same for the student organizations. This is file JJA. Um, this is an MASC policy that we do not currently have. So I would make a motion to accept the first reading of JJA. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Moving on to our next category. Um, we have a new MASC policy that just came out in February. Um, file JICFA, this is the prohibition of hazing, so we are suggesting adoption of this policy. Um, so I would make a motion to accept the first reading of this prohibition of hazing policy. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Next we would like to, um, we are recommending deletion of file ACC, a diversity policy. Um, it is outdated and has been rendered obsolete by our much more recent and robust diversity policies. So I make a motion to delete file ACC. Second. Discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? 
Likewise, um, we have on our books a student-to-student -student harassment, which is also an out-of-date policy that does not have an MASC equivalent. So we're, I would make a motion to accept the deletion of this student-to-student -student harassment. I'll second. <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? The next one is our non-discrimination policy. We are not um, suggesting any substance change, but merely a bureaucratic updating here of to remove specific names of employees and just replace it with titles so that way it does not get um, obsolete when we have new people enter into these positions. So I would make a motion to accept the first reading of file AC non-discrimination. I'll second. Discussion? All those in favor? Then up next we have um, file AA, school district legal status, and we would like to accept the updated MASC version to replace our existing old policy that is out of date. So I'd make a motion to accept the new MASC school district legal status. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? Similarly, we would like to accept the new MASC school committee's powers and duties, file BBA. Um, which is would replace our again very outdated previous policy. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? We're getting there. We're getting there. We're almost done. Um, okay. Then we have a very old. It's sort of funny if you read it. The school committee elections policy. It's just full of lies. Um, we've got five members. <laughs> term of last three years. So we would like to delete. I make a motion to delete file B B B. Wait. So wait a second. We're here for three years then. Yes. Yeah, we're here for three years. One members. of us shouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> so we Still would like to remove that. that. So I think Shant. Oh, did you second? Who Shant? I seconded. Who did? I seconded. He did. <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, another new policy from MASC, the school committee organizational meeting. This would replace our old policy of the same nature. So I would make a motion to accept the first reading of this. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. I think we are on to our last one. Um, School committee organizational. Nope, nope, nope. Right. School committee member yeah. ethics. So we would like to replace our existing policy with a new version from MASC. I make a motion to accept the school committee member ethics. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. So now a collaborative update. Indeed. Um, so uh, just a few things I'd like to share with you from our last meeting, which was on uh, the 27th of last month. Um, so our presentation, as we always start, uh, was from, um, <clears throat> for the first time ever, from some students, which I thought was pretty fantastic. Uh, they had a group come in from Mount Tom Academy, which um, I didn't know a whole lot about, so it was great to uh, learn more about that program. Um, it's really small um, and very focused. Um, they called it uh, a modern version of a one-room schoolhouse, which I thought was a pretty apropos description. Um, essentially, um, the students uh, all go through self-directed learning. Um, there's a lot of it online, but they have opportunities to work in groups there in that open space. Um, and they uh, also, um, because there are so few of them, uh, that every week they get these individually tailored reports sort of showing them um, their work and what they were good at and what they still need to um, work on. Uh, there are grades 9 through 12 with one teacher, and I think there are 17 students, she said, this year. Um, they usually cap it right around there. Um, Barbara Cheney, who's the director and teacher, um, she's an appointed fellow of the Summit Learning Network, if uh, any of the educators here know that. Um, and she travels all over instructing other <coughs> teachers around the country, um, but she's here teaching for um, our region's children. And uh, if anybody's interested from the committee or our superintendent or the schools, they said they're happy to receive visitors. I don't know how this works, but they said you don't even have to let them know ahead of time. That seems 
little odd. Uh, maybe give them a call. Um, but they're, you know, they fill up quickly, um, but they, um, the program I think is really important and they serve uh, specifically students who are, um, you know, being bullied. They might be in DYS and they might be at risk of dropping out of school for some reason. And uh, this program is there as an opportunity to um, sort of keep them from falling through the cracks and uh, really tailor um, their education around them and make them, you know, want to go to school again. And hearing from the students themselves and how uh, that has been achieved for them was, um, was just really great to, to hear about and um, I appreciated their presentation. Um, so, a couple other things. There are some matters for action. Gateway Regional, we voted back into the collaborative after having been out for a few years. Um, there's uh, an inclement weather policy that they updated. They're not, we're not the only ones doing policy updates. So, uh, collaborative programs are delayed or close early if every single school in their member districts wow, do the same, good. which I feel like has got to never happen. <laughs> um, but you know, gotta have that policy there. That's and then the bar every single school has, has to, to do one of those things, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we also received a financial report as always, and um, it's a lot better than the last time around. Um, so they went through the reorganization. They've been transitioning to some new software uh, to sort of better um, keep track of um, their billable hours and the money that goes in and out. Um, and uh, through all of these changes, it seems to have had a really substantial impact on the organization. To give you a frame of reference, so uh, as of January 31st of this year, they had a $126,000 surplus uh, that was compared to an almost $300,000 deficit at the wow. same time last year. Um, so yeah. they uh, have they've really made some important and substantial changes, um, and it seems to be doing some great things for the, the organization. Um, we also started the uh, evaluation process for the executive director. Um, the board members will be um, getting the tools sent out to them this month for that. Um, the superintendents as well, if you haven't received it already. Okay. And um, the evaluation subcommittee is going to be reporting on the results next time. So I'll let you know. Uh, the next meeting is Wednesday, uh, May 29th, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll let you know after that. Thank you. Um, Mount Tom Academy is a really interesting program. We've Absolutely. had a number of students from my district go through there. Um, not kids who were bullied, but kids who really had a difficult time settling into the routine and the curriculum of, um, or the rigor of, a regular traditional public school and yet um, going and having someone just monitor their self-directed pace was just felt like a better fit for them so I really I have a lot of respect for that program yeah, that's why I came out of it the same way mm -hmm. um, and the so it's at the HCC campus mm -hmm. and uh, the students are basically treated like college students mm -hmm. but they still graduate from their sending yep. district you still hold them. Um, so yeah, um, it, was, it was great to learn about. It's a very neat program. So thank you. Do we have an education policy update? Um, I think I was just going to mention that I know a lot of people in the Massachusetts school communities this week have been um, talking and thinking about the um, problematic question that showed up on the MCAS mm -hmm. for high school students mm -hmm. and. Um, I wanted to thank our superintendent for acknowledging that that question um, was that we had potentially had 10th graders who were exposed to that question and the school was aware that there might be needs for processing or support mm -hmm. um, as that question did ask students to, to my understanding, to like inhabit a racist perspective for a writing prompt. Um, and I think, you know, that this incident upsetting all on its own but also emblematic for a lot of parents of what feels like the disconnect between the kind of teacher and student-centered learning and evaluation that we want to be happening and these kind of exterior forms of assessment that are coming from the state instead of coming out of our schools. And so as a school committee member, I'm well aware of how much the MCAS is our reality and <laughs> we have to do well if we want to um, not face 
a lot of punitive consequences, but um, also would hope that um, you know we could all be working towards some future where there are less stakes um, posed by these tests that are clearly flawed and not what we want for our kids. I do acknowledge how flawed that certain question was, but I also worry about now the drive to make that whole MCAS test not valid. Mm. Because I would hate to see the students have to go through have another test. Oh. That's what worries me. Okay. So, have you heard have yes, you heard that there, is, of that? there mm. has been um, wow. different things online. Well, I think people I think the the, the feeling that that some people had with that that moved to strike the whole test was, my sense was, they were saying that kids having had to answer <coughs> that question then had to continue on with the rest of the oh, test. They yeah. not and so therefore well they as. may not have mm -hmm. scored as high as if they had not been upset about the, the test. Mm -hmm. And I know um, we got feedback from our students after it and, and they, they were very, they were, some were unsure, some were confused, some were frustrated, some were upset. Um, they were all uncomfortable. In Hatfield? In yeah, Hatfield. Okay. So, you know, their question was, um, we hope we did well on the rest of the test. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that feedback comes from. But my sense was um, that that question was gonna be struck and that there would be some, they would look at the results of how kids did before so they made a decision. <coughs> I, I appreciate so, all of that. Yeah. And I can see how students would be yeah. upset, mm -hmm. but I also think it would be very upsetting to have to do it. It would test be. Again. I would never so want I those students to have to do it again. And I don't think they would want, um, I think if you surveyed students, they would not want to take it again. No. Um, <laughs> because it's a longer test than usual. Yeah. That was a surprise for me. Um, each each session is much much longer mm -hmm. so having done it and a lot of students at least my students were felt glad that it was over they would never want to take right. it again so that's they're what just hoping they pass yeah. so yeah but it was it was an unusual event mm -hmm. and I do think that um, the feedback was that the the committee that was supposed to look at these questions Kind of missed the boat on that issue. Mm -hmm. they, they dropped the ball. I don't know how many mm -hmm. phrases I can come up with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're going to look at it a little more carefully next time. And I'm not surprised that there were glitches because this is the first time this is rolling out. And I remember when it first, when MCAS first started, there was um, this, the first year had a lot of little kinks and you get the kinks out and you score and evaluate kids taking that in, into consideration so hopefully that will happen again are you nodding your head yes I'm nodding my head because <laughs> you and I are probably the only ones at the table that remember when MCAS first Me too. started and <laughs> I yeah. all right so yeah it was unfortunate Next year will be better, we hope. All right, do we have a wellness committee update? Well, we are meeting tomorrow to go over the logistics for our exciting May 8th event. We're definitely holding a citywide school walk, bike, or roll, I should add, we could roll as well on the bike path um, to school event. And we're gonna have two different shifts. And Tandem Bagel, once again, has agreed to generously donate bagels to provide breakfast before walking to school that day or riding so we'll be meeting tomorrow and um, I hope that principals will be able to agree to have the Mass Department of Transportation come in and provide the half hour training safety training sessions they have um, offered to the district so I don't know if that can work out with the schedule of the PE classes but that's what I hope to arrange tomorrow Cool. So you'll know if you you were able to do that after your meeting. Yeah, they're oh, coming. Right. Principals cool. are coming. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thanks. Health and safety. 
Uh, so the committee has not met, but I do want to raise something that was sent to me. Um, it was, uh, there's a eighth grade civics class. Um, Miss, and I may pronounce print, this, Capen Parizio. Um, so she has a class that does with eighth grade civics. And so I was sent a PowerPoint by three of the students, um, Zachary, Kyle, and Angel. Um, and they were students who are in eighth grade at White Brook Middle School, and they were had a PowerPoint presentation raising concerns about the water fountains. Um, that nine out of the sixteen water fountains don't work at White Brook, um, and they were putting forward a proposal around um, some potentially even creative way of fundraising to put in. Uh, water fountains into the two different cafeterias that would also then be able to um, fill water bottles and such. So uh, I thought it was really exciting first off for those three students to reach out um, and so we are, I have sort of raised those questions and we're starting to do a sort of a review through that um, with some of the different people involved and we'll sort of uh, potentially get them involved and bring them in and sort of engage them as well sort of maybe beyond what they were expecting but hopefully it sort of <laughs> show that that's great that kids are um, using that opportunity to, to speak up. So I want to support that and recognize that. So. Excellent. So thank you again to Kyle, Zachary, and Angel. And I did get a letter from Angel um, concerning that that I forwarded to um, Dr. LeClaire and I figure we'll be talking about it all of us in the future. Yes, I got three letters <coughs> as well. So, yes. But I thought that we had to wait to yep. pass them to the yep. superintendent before bringing it up. But I did okay. get the one also on the water fountains and I thought it would be good to work with the students to see if there could be possible fundraising. I know that's been done in other districts to get those refillable water stations. So, yeah. so my sense is we'll, we'll discuss mm -hmm. this at a future date. Oh, that's okay. Sounds good. But I liked it. That's good. <laughs> All right. Just Superintendent update. Oh no, wait a oh. minute. Marissa has something. I want to say one other yes. thing. Um, I was really excited the other day to see on the front cover of the Daily Hampshire Gazette our Maple community um, getting together to form a um, advocacy about not idling cars outside of the school buildings while waiting to pick up your kids. Um, I know that there have been some really passionate kids and parents. Um, Paula Garcia is a Maple mom who really cares about the environment and environmental health and she worked with teachers and the kids and they have all sorts of great posters where they mm -hmm. did research on the environmental impacts and also the impacts on um, the health of children who are inhaling the exhaust from these idling cars. So um, I was really proud to see all that work happening at Maple and also um, wanted to sort of use this little platform to promote their messages again that um, when we're waiting for our kids as we're doing pickup, turn the car off and it'll just reduce, it's an easy small way that we can reduce the air pollution and particularly the pollution that's going right from our cars to the lungs of the young kids who are at the playground and siblings waiting for their, their um, sisters and brothers to come out of the buildings. And maybe if I can follow up on that too. So as a green community, mm -hmm. East Hampton actually has an anti-idling uh, law policy in place. And so that that is in place, they're not supposed to be idling their vehicles. Um, and that was part of our sort of becoming a green community back in 2010. Um, so hopefully that will be, uh, they'll, they'll help them enforce that. So more than just take goodwill. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. So. And aren't there signs downstairs that say no idling? Yes. Than, yeah. yeah, there are signs is there. I think there's signs. I think it the signs outside of Maple say five minutes. You I think that's what it says out yeah. front, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah front I think that's the same part time. that makes it difficult to enforce and really, you know, who's timing that five There's minutes. nobody timing it. It's really a question of sort of uh, self-regulation yes. in terms yes. of yeah. that and recognizing, again, the impact on our kids yeah. um, around our schools and hopefully that they do, parents do not sit and idle their cars so um, but yeah there's no, there's no idling police out there uh, looking to enforce it um, but maybe they are going to be a little bit more since there are people at the schools maybe there'll be a little bit more uh, commentary coming out of this because of the kids and the parents yeah. involvement on this issue yeah. and a, a reminder just to echo so it's great to see all those signs outside of Maple School reminding you to turn your mm -hmm. car off but it's not just Maple School. They want this message to spread everywhere. So mm -hmm. um, I know there's probably folks yeah. out there listening from yeah. Center Pep in White That's Brook. Right. Um, probably less so at the high school, but I bet you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even at the Pride Station, turn your car off. Yeah. 
Excellent. Or returning library books. Or returning library books. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you go to the Dropbox, in which case that's probably yeah. happening. It's less than five minutes. <laughs> All right. Superintendent update. So this evening we have a presentation from uh, Tim Alex, our project manager, and Burt Gardner, our architect, who are going to give us an update on the progress that we're making with the school building project. We had a building committee up, uh, meeting tonight right before the school committee meeting, so uh, we meet monthly for those in the community that, that are not aware of that. And so we've been plugging along, but I don't think this committee as a whole has had an update all year. So we thought it would be a, an opportune time to give the school committee an update on the project. So gentlemen, if you'd like to come up and... I'll come up. If you never connected to this one, I'm assuming it's gonna be the it's same. It's gonna be the same as the conference room. I've, I think there's just a different code, but it's the same process. Yeah, it you is. Gotta, you might have to walk this. closer to okay. it. Okay. Is there the green light going on? Takes a minute. Sounds like it sounds. It fancy. sounds like something, something came out. <laughs> It was a very nice looking building as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's in very the dark clean. right now. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a view of about 10 p.m. <laughs> it should it's coming on. I see Sony. Yeah. Oh there yeah. you go. Should we turn the lights up? Yes, because it was there was a nasty glare in the room. Oh, the room. Thanks. So thank you, sir. Maybe just even that first bank or something. Bert, do you and Tim just want to point out who is who while you're getting that prepared? I don't know if the committee knows. Well, who. I'm Tim Alex. I'll, <laughs> I'll kind of get started, assuming uh, uh, this will be up in a minute. But um, I work with Colliers International. We're the owners project managers on the project. Um, uh, what our role is is to act as your advocate throughout the process. So we are, uh, instead of the, the district um, dedicating some staff member who has something else that they could be doing, um, to, to manage this process, uh, you bring in an owner's project manager to, to help manage that process. We act as a conduit with the MSBA, the um, funding authority through the state, um, work with the design team and, and their team that they've put together. Um, so that's kind of our role in the process. Um, there it is. The other uh, team members really is what we have is, is uh, Kalo and Beanick and their sub-consultants, so the mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, the various sub-consultants, and then the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which is, again, the funding process and uh, funding arm that, that uh, help will reimburse a majority or a significant amount of this project. So talk about a little bit about the timeline. Um, there's this about two years that took place before we were even involved. So the su submitting the statement of interest back in 2014 um, and then getting accepted into the program. Um, but then uh, we came on board in 2016. Our first uh, duty is to bring on uh, the design team and get that process started. Um, and then you go through the feasibility and schematic design phases of the design. So really, you talk about the visioning. Um, if you think back, well, a couple of years ago, we sat in this room and mm -hmm. brought in a lot of different staff and parents and community members and really talked about a vision. What, what is education in East Hampton gonna be in the future, in the, in the next century? So that whole process started out that feasibility and we really went worked to a milestone of getting uh, a submission to the MSBA, um, uh, multiple submissions actually, where they provide comment back and forth, but um, uh, a, a lot of steps along the way with the MSBA process. But getting to a point where 
um, there was the local vote for moving the project forward? Is it something that the, the um, community is supporting? So now that we've gotten through that, now we get into the more of the detailed design. So you see that kind of green bar in the upper section, which is the design and bid section. Um, and that's going to take us through the end of this year. So um, that's kind of what's been taking place to this point. Um, and then construction will go from uh, the beginning of 2020 through 2022. Um, you know, we'll have moved in, the students will be in the building uh, about three, halfway through um, that year and occupying it, but there's the closeout process that you need to go through and, and punch list and, and cleaning things up. Um, and then the paperwork and closeout process for the MSBA would actually even go out further into 2023. Um, we included down below just an example of the timeline for the high school project. So you can see um, that was a little bit shorter process, um, but you can see each of those bars along the way are a little bit shorter. It's a, a smaller building, a smaller uh, undertaking. So uh, just the evolution of, uh, of this project just has drawn it out a little bit further. All right. Again, my name's Bert. I'm uh, with Kalo and Architects and um, Tim's right, this is a much larger project than the high school, and it's not just a larger building, and it, it, it is a very large building, a thousand students plus that are gonna be in this in this building. But it's a much more complicated building. Um, we're going, we're consolidating, you know, three elementary schools and a middle school into one facility. Um, and part of the MSBA feasibility study process was to look at all the options that you could kind of approach in either just renovating Maple School, um, you know, just fixing what's wrong with it or adding on to it um, or consolidating all three of the elementary schools or the option that ultimately panned out, which was to consolidate the elementaries in the middle school. Um, so, very ambitious project. Um, I'm glad to see that the city supported it, um, not just because it's a, it's a project to keep us busy for a couple of years, but I, I'm a resident in East Hampton and um, my kids went through the public school department here. Um, and I think that it's it's a, a a worthy investment in our community to to you know build new school facilities for their for their children. So I don't think that I've ever updated this committee. I've done a lot of public presentations in town. I've done a lot of presentations to the building committee and various groups, but I don't think I've ever been in front of the school committee for an update. So here we go. <laughs> um, Project phasing, because it's so large and uh, we don't want to displace any students that are in classrooms today during the construction of this project, we're going to phase this um, so that we build the complete new building facility where the football field is in Whitebrook while the Whitebrook building is still in place. Um, that'll create some logistical issues on site, but nothing that's not overcome um, through careful planning. So we're fortunate that Whitebrook has two driveways in right now, one's an entrance and one's an exit, but they're wide enough that they can serve two directions. So one of the first things that the contractor will do is he'll isolate <laughs> one of them for construction traffic and one will remain for school traffic. And that'll keep um, a separation of both pedestrians and ve vehicular traffic um, during the construction period and just make it a safer site altogether. Obviously, the construction area will be fenced off. I think that um, it'd be prudent for um, an assembly with students to kind of go over what, what safe behavior is adjacent to a construction site before the, before the job begins. Um, but I trust all that will happen. And, and um, if you need any assistance from, from the design team, we're, we're more than happy to do that. Um, but the site will be uh, blocked off what we're going to retain is the existing bus loop, the south parking lot in full, and we're going to try to keep about half of the north parking lot available for school use during this time. Um, the diagram that kind of shades everything yellow is, is construction zone, uh, is something that we come up with in our best judgment, but the contractor ultimately will fine tune that diagram. So. But they've, um, you know, the big GCs, any GC that's big enough to do a project this size is very familiar with phasing and working on occupied sites. And, um, you know, safety is always a, a number one priority with, with them. So. Um, so going through the construction of the new, new school, um, once that's complete January 2022, we anticipate all of the, the classrooms in Whitebrook to move over. So even though fifth grade is going to move to a, an elementary level, ultimately, 
we'll make sure that the fifth grade classroom wing in the new building is 100% complete and ready for students to move in. So you can do a one-for-one -one move in January of 22. Um, at that point, all the fencing will kind of switch sides and the construction traffic and the, the school traffic can all switch sides. We'll have um, a decent amount of the, of the middle school lot paved probably with a binder course, not a finished course, so that we can have, um, have it in the best condition when we ultimately turn over the whole school to you. Um, but it won't be a mud parking lot or anything like that for you. Um, I won't try to fool anyone thinking that it's a, a simple, you know, that you're gonna have a lot of parking or ample parking. It's gonna be somewhat challenging, but I think that we'll, we'll get close to the parking that you've got while the school is under construction in that area. Um, Whitebrook Middle School will come down. I think that that will actually start in the summer of um, 21. They've got to abate Whitebrook, get all the hazardous materials out of it, and then they can take the building down. Once that building's down, our new school is actually, the first floor of the new school is actually kind of right in the middle of where your existing football field is and where the floor of Whitebrook is now. So it's about five feet higher than the existing football field. That means that um, that parking lot is also down lower than what Whitebrook Middle School is now. So there's some logistics that we have to make sure that um, utilities are coordinated. They don't bury um, electrical service lines down five feet. So we've got to really kind of be careful not to disturb any of the, the existing utilities feeding Whitebrook while we're working on the parking lot, the new parking lot area. Um, but once you're out of the building, they can take that all down. They've got to take a lot. There's a lot of cut. We're removing a lot of earth from the site. Um, <coughs> Williston is putting a, a solar array up by the road. Um, and they've said that we can put some of our, our material on that to kind of take out the slope there, which is a real benefit for the city because it costs a lot of money to take material off site and dispose of it somewhere. Um, so they'll take down Whitebrook, they'll, they'll scrape the ground down to the grades it's supposed to be at ultimately, and then um, the construction of the rest of the parking lots in the football field um, on the south side of the site will take place. So that um, ultimately, you'll have a finished project um, by the fall of 2022, uh, when all the students come back. I'm not sure what this is telling me. No. Can you just X that? He was just asking me if I'm happy with the colors on the screen. Are people happy? <laughs> um, so everything will be available in the fall. I think the next one kind of, yeah, starts talking about how the site is organized for you. So we met with the district today actually to go over kind of the detailed organization of the site. This is more of an overall diagram um, because I'm sure people would like to get home at some point. But we've got organization of the school for people that don't know you can see there's a middle school entrance to the left and then there's an elementary school entrance so the elementary school wing is to the side uh, to the right hand side of the plan the middle school wing is to the left hand side of the plan and everything in the middle is your cafeterias and your gyms and all the shared spaces so um, we've got two courtyards between the elementary school wings um, which are more quiet outdoor classroom type spaces uh, the way we're planning it. And then we've got an active play area for recesses and, and gym activities and things like that, which are away from the classroom so as not to create distractions, um, either visually or, or with noise. Um, but that's buffered by an emergency access road. Um, we plan to kind of claim that road for recess activities. So we'll have four square, you know, and hopscotch painted on that so that it's not just um, an obvious fire road going <coughs> around, that it, that it that it's really, it belongs to the kids that are gonna be outside in the, in, in, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then we've really got a lot of natural features planned. Uh, conversely, we'll develop the western side of the site, um, kind of up on the, the current practice fields um, for the middle school out outdoor play um, and recreational and, and gym and we'll, We'll work in some outdoor classroom spaces up, up in that, that area as well. We're really trying to use landscaping features rather than physical features or built features, um, or obviously built features. Um, you know, it's all construction and it's constructed, but it, we want to incorporate a lot of, um, a lot of natural features into the, into the, into the project um, related to safety. As I said, that emergency access vehicle road going around the building. Um, we don't want it to be striped fire lane. We want it to, to be for students. We'll have a gate up at either end to prevent people from going on it other than, than the, the fire department and police department. Um, 
during an emergency, but really give that to the students. Um, there's a secondary access through, through the um, Treehouse neighborhood that we'll maintain through this project. Um, a license plate camera, you can see that ultimately we're only going to have one drive in and out of the school. It'll be wider than what either side is now so that if there um, is an event where fire trucks are coming in, there's ample room for, for other vehicles to pull off to the shoulder without any um, interference with pedestrian traffic. Um, but a single driveway, which will make it easy to, to capture license plates for cars coming in and going out. Um, more, is, more of a recording, you know, to be used. All the security cameras really for the project are, they're, they're recordings, they're not preventative, but they're, you know, for record so that you can, you can find out, you know, who was involved in, in an incident. Um, but then we want buffers between the, the, the school and um, the parking lots, and we want to control where, where the pedestrians are, are crossing access points. So what we're doing is we're using um, rain gardens to kind of isolate the, the paved areas from the, the classroom wings so that it's an, it's an apparent zone where, you know, people's really, it won't be comfortable to hang out, but it also is visual. So people would say, well, what's that guy doing in, in, in the rain garden? Um, we don't want people being able to just walk right up to the first floor windows. Um, Similarly, between the parking lot and the, and the bus loop, we, are, we want to create kind of berm, berm features so that a student getting out of a parent's car doesn't just, you know, get out the door and walk straight across the bus loop wherever they happen to be parked. We want to make sure that they're directed through the natural landscaping features to, to crossing points um, that are safe for them to get into the building. So, um, this one's kind of... hand corner is a, an example of a rain garden. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see there's some boulders, there's some gravel. It depresses, uh, you know, about a foot and a half, two feet from all the paved areas, and, and it'll be planted. That, that's a, a new one, so the, the plantings aren't robust, but um, there will be plantings in this to, to kind of serve as that buffer that we're looking for between the, the sidewalks and parking areas and the, and the first floor windows. Um, lower left, you can't really read that well with the light either, but those are the kind of the berm features um, where there's a walk and then there's, you know, it kind of goes off to the right between two berms. Um, but a, a very uh, obvious visual cue of this is where you're supposed to go, um, not over the berm. Um, for the areas that we're developing out in the playground areas and the classroom spaces, again, we want, um, we're going way back uh, a couple of years to those visioning sessions and how important it was to the community, um, especially given the White Brick site. Um, that, that you've got as a resource, that the project really incorporate as much natural features into it as possible and, and build strong connections with the, with the natural environment. So rather than putting up a lot of plastic play structures, um, we're really looking to use kind of just the natural, the natural features of the site. We'll create some berms and things. Um, there are going to be dry stream beds that will collect roof rainwater, for instance, and, and run through. Um, in the courtyards, those kind of meander alongside of the path that leads from the courtyards out to the active play area um, with little crossings underneath the walkway and things like that so that they, students can really kind of engage in it and, and you know, can build curriculum around it as far as, you know, what happens to rain when it, when it comes out of the sky and hits a, a building. Well, eventually it's got to make its way back into the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, all these features are intended to be really dual, dual purpose to serve a, an educational function um, as well as, you know, a function just as a, as a nice place to be or for recreation. Um, a lot of natural seeding out of, you know, whether they're stumps that are cut for seeding or whether they're large boulders kind of set in, a, in an amphitheater style arrangement. Um, that's the, that's the feel that we want to get with this. Uh, I mentioned that we have some berms. Um, rather than a, a climbing up a ladder to a slide and coming down, we're going to use the natural earth features. So we'll have at grade play features. So, you know, kids can get to the top of the berm and then slide down kind of right with the slope of the berm. Um, it's safer for students. You don't have to worry about fall zones and, and all, all of that kind of safety code stuff. Um, so. And I think just really a, a wide variety of outdoor space. Um, we were talking about the way we envision it um, when we met with the district to talk about it. Um, when we see that this is an outdoor classroom space, so this is a nice place that it'll be quieter for students that want that. Um, but the reality is that there's going to be such a variety that um, I think that students and staff will kind of find find the spaces and what they want to do with them and kind of make them their own. So. Getting back to the organization of the school, I, I kind of went over the, the 
quick summary elementary on the right, the three wings on the right, the middle school is on the left, um, that single wing heading out to the west and all the shared spaces in the middle. The middle school wing is three stories tall, one grade per floor. The elementary school is two stories tall um, and each pod on a floor has, has a grade in it. So starting at the bottom, the long wing is the pre-K K wing, so it's your early education wing. And then moving up to the middle is first grade and then second grade. And then on the second floor, we're looking at the bottom over the pre-Ks, your third grade, fourth grade, and then fifth grade at the top. Um, and that puts the fifth graders kind of close to the middle school side of the building so that as they're preparing to transition uh, over to the middle school and taking trips, they've got easier access to, um, to the building itself, but to their media center, for instance, and other, other things um, that, that, can, that can occur as far as um, that transition process goes. We do have a connection between the two schools, a physical hall corridor um, that kind of goes between the gym and the cafeterias, the nurses on that corridor. Um, and that's to allow kind of um, structured interaction between the grades. So there's no reason for a student on their own to ever cross sides, but if there's a mentoring program or something that the, the school wants to, to instill, there's a pathway for the two sides to interact with each other. Um, and the nurse kind of being right in the middle is ideal too, and there is a door in that corridor um, that, that can remain closed. And there's waiting areas to the nurse from either side of the door. So the elementary school have their waiting area, middle school has a separate waiting area. Um, and the resting areas inside the, the nurse's station are also separated like that too. So two cafeterias as well. Um, so elementary school's got a cafeteria, middle school's got a cafeteria, the kitchen's right in the middle, and each side has their own serving lines that, that are remote from each other. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's little red ovals at the end of each of the, the classroom wings. Um, basically, that's so that you can isolate that center gym and cafeteria, all the, all the shared use spaces um, from the academic spaces in the building. It's good for community use after hours. If you've got basketball or rec games going on on the weekends, if you've got any kind of events and like a dance that's may maybe in the cafeteria, you can have all those classroom wings locked off during, during those events. Um, so you don't have to worry about people meandering through your building. Um, and then it obviously it, ser it serves a security function as well. If there was ever an incident in the school and you went into a lockdown, um, those doors will automatically all close and lock um, so that there's, there's no access. Uh, talking about safety a little bit, the idea is to create layers. I started talking about the buffers that we want to create outside with the landscaping. Um, but the whole idea is just to, to put up as many layers into this for, for, for an intruder trying to get into the building as we can to slow them down and give first responders time to get to the site before, you know, and before there's any serious issues. So the next set of layers would be, um, well, one of the layers is say, say someone crossed our rain garden and went up to a, a first floor classroom window. Um, all of that glass on the first floor is laminated. That's not bulletproof. Um, but it's shatterproof. So someone couldn't go up with a large rock and throw it through the window to gain access into the building. Um, the window would kind of crack but stay in place. Uh, there's, um, I'll get to the next slide, but the interior vestibule glass. So you can get into the vestibule just like at your high school, but the interior doors are locked and that glass is bulletproof. Um, I say bulletproof, it's bullet resistant, level three. So. Um, Everybody always will make something big enough to get through anything that you, you build, but um, level three is pretty much the standard for most most um, weapons that we would be used in a, in a shooting event at a school. Um, so that's another barrier. No one can get into the building without going through the office, and you've got to be buzzed into the office. Um, it's unlike the high school where you're buzzed into the school, um, it's a similar thing. You got an intercom, and you got to tell who you are. Um, but once you're in the once you're in the school, we don't want people to just have free reign. You've got to go into the office and sign in, and then, you know, depending on school policies, either be escorted where you need to go, or if you know, you're a regular, you know, visitor, and you've got a standing meeting, you'll know where to go. But you'll have an I, a badge, and 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 you'll be signed in. So, this kind of just shows the the scenario. You go into the vestibule, you're going to be met with a camera and an intercom. The reception will have control over that. Um, and they'll be able to either let you in or, or not let you into the school. So that's just another layer that we built in. 
So one of the things that changed since schematic design is we moved, um, we really celebrated more the, the, the media centers in their location. The media center really in the middle school was the, the one that was problematic. It was on the second floor because we were trying to maintain community access of, of the media centers so that it could be a resource for the community. Um, but in thinking it through, um, what it did is it, it, it basically gave you a, a media center, which is a large room and a 10 foot ceiling which you know, really felt like the, the, the larger the space, the higher you want your ceilings to be. It limited daylight um, and, and just didn't allow us to do as much architecture as we would have liked with that, a space of that, of that programming. Um, so the superintendent said, oh, well, what, can we look at it on the third floor and what, what that would do? And it really did help a lot. So it really helped the media centers <coughs> to become more celebrated spaces. Um, the elementary school media center kind of stayed where it was because it was it's only two stories for one thing it was already on the second floor um, but it, it's a good location for for all the students to access but we kind of took cues when we you know as we started really saying this is going to be really the icon for the school this is this is this is the space that we want to really focus on and and have it represent the forward thinking of the district so a lot of different zones in the in the media center you you've got small group area you've got classroom instruction you've got stacks You've got project areas, informal seating, s smaller areas for someone that just wants a quiet place to read a book. Um, there's a green screen room, um, lots of display areas. We toured some, some media centers, some other media centers, um, and pulled some ideas, things that worked well for them, things that didn't. Um, and then we applied those same, those same concepts over onto the elementary side, which actually resulted in a classroom for the, for the elementary school side. We, had, we didn't have a, a dedicated classroom for that media center. Um, but a shared function of the media center classroom is going to be professional learning communities. And it just seemed awkward to have the elementary school teachers kind of have to be tenants of the middle school side for their professional learning. Um, so, so we created a classroom kind of off, of off of the elementary school as well. And when it's not being used for that, obviously the, the, the librarian has control of that space and can use it for different things. Or it can be used even as a breakout space if a teacher wants to book it for a special, special project. So. so this is what the building is kind of shaping up like. Um, as I said, it's a very large building, and because we've organized it into wings, classroom wings, it became a very long building. So if you think about, um, we started on the football field, and the end of the middle school is just on the west side of the tennis courts, if people recognize the parking area as tennis courts still. Um, but where the football comes up, levels off, before it goes back up onto the practice fields, those are the old tennis courts. And so our building kind of extends a little bit beyond that. So it's a very long building, and that was a challenge architecturally to not make it look like this, you know, structure that just went on forever and ever. So, um, and it's also kind of an irregular program. Um, one of the we got DESI approval last week, by the way, for our, our plans, um, which is a big a big step. Um, it's required for the for the project, um, but they really take a, a hard look at your distribution of special ed spaces. Special ed spaces aren't typically all the same size as classrooms. So when you've got to distribute these all around, you don't end up with floor plans that stack perfectly the way we'd all, well, the way us architects would like to see them. <laughs> um, and that presents challenges for us um, in getting windows to line up from floor to floor so that your building looks like it's ordered and not just a haphazard mess. Um, and then we've got to work in you know, technical details, like where's the, the cross bracing on the structural frame for earthquake and wind loads. Um, but what we came up with is a, a series of regular punched openings in the masonry, uh, which you can see they read as the squares there. And then, um, so that's all, it's a brick building for the most part. But within those squares, uh, the windows don't take up the entire square. Uh, the next slide will actually show a little bit better. Well, maybe not, but um, sorry that it's so kind of dull for, the, for the, um, the graphics, but but it's a mix of windows and solid metal, metal panels. Um, and so the, by doing that, we were kind of able to shift the location of the windows around within this location so that they don't have to necessarily be right on top of each other from floor to floor, but the openings still kind of stay this consistent, regular um, <coughs> rhythm of, of openings down the, down the building's facades. We also kind of took opportunities to, to stop the brick with these taller vertical slots um, so that the, it reads more of a series of pods as you go down the building wings to kind of, again, counter that 
that long horizontality that the building would have had. Um, so it's really dark, but you can kind of see in the upper, upper image a little bit better that the media center is on the top. Um, those are going to be a different color metal panel, um, a standing seam panel, and they're going to have roofs that are a little bit higher, and, and it's a shed roof, so it kind of pitches up and opens out towards the vista um, if you're inside looking out. Um, really large windows. One challenge there is that both, element, or both the elementary and middle school media centers are located on the south side of the building, which is, um, <coughs> you know, large windows, south side of the building equals heat load uh, on the building. Um, so what we've got is um, a perforated, it's called a perforated image wall, but it's basically a metal panels that have um, different size openings, um, laser cut into it, and it can be whatever we want. We can basically give them a photograph and they'll give us that image back in the, just based on the spacing and the size of the, the openings that are in it. Um, so that'll be a really interesting feature, um, but it'll also shade those, those self-facing large windows from the solar heat gain that you'd get. Um, from the inside, I'm excited because it's gonna mean that the media centers are consistent, uh, constantly changing space throughout the day as the sun moves a across its path. Um, Every time you come in at different times of day, it's going to look a little bit different with the way the light is playing off of things. And the perforations will probably be an interesting pattern on the floor, too, so, or bookshelves. So, <clears throat> We do have sunshades built into the building. Um, again, just to, on the west and south facades, just to counter the solar heat gain and, and create some shade um, on those windows. So when we talk about colors and materials in the building, um, we want a neutral color or color palette, um, and again, tying back to kind of more of the earth tones in the building. That's what the overall building color scheme will be. And then we're going to use color to, uh, as an accent, um, whether it's in a classroom teaching wall or through furnishings, uh, or, or we'll use it maybe in corridors for wayfinding. Um, but it'll be the accent. Um, the, the beauty there is as trends change and colors, you know, go in and out of style it's easy to kind of manipulate those smaller areas um, so that it doesn't look like you walk into the building and say, oh, this building was built in 2022. <laughs> you know, or oh, white brook. We all know when that was built. <laughs> so, um, and to encourage that that, that would, would maybe change over time and not still be the same finishes that were in it when, when we, um, we built it. Um, but that's the idea with the colors. A lot of, you know, wherever we can kind of incorporate a wood look for to bring some warmth into it we're going to do so so um, the, the public spaces for instance have a wood slat looking ceiling in them so if you look up it looks like the ceiling will be wood slats on on those on the main street the lobbies in the main street quarters so <coughs> flooring systems in the public zones we want something that's durable and easy main, easy to maintain as, a, as the priority um, and cost effective. So our base bid is to do a polished concrete. Polished concrete comes in all kinds of um, <coughs> degrees of finishing. Uh, if you go into a Walmart or a Home Depot, that's often a polished concrete floor, but probably not the polished concrete floor that we're looking for in the school. We want something that's going to be a little bit more attractive. And what we can do is we can really control um, how much shine you get, how much reflection, check reflection that you get in it. Um, and even shiny, I've been on these um, and put water on them to test for like friction coefficients and that they don't get slippery like you might think that they would if you're looking at it in the picture. Um, but the more shine, kind of the, the more high class things tend to look. So a lot of times school districts or upper education universities will want us to have a, a higher polish on them. Um, but you can also grind the concrete too. So anyone that looks at a finished concrete slab, it's just gray, it's a smooth gray surface, but if you grind that down, you start to expose a lot of the aggregates that are in the concrete mix, and it, it, it adds interest, basically, in a texture to the floor. And then we can stain that concrete as well, so that we are planning to have different colors, probably three colors, three different colors incorporated into it. And again, we'll use those for wayfinding or to accent, you know, entrances to an, a specific area or something. Um, on the left is kind of just a quick rendering of the of the elementary school main street corridor when you come into the lobby. You can kind of see there's a light gray, a medium gray, and then there's the darker line. The darker line kind of meanders its way all the way back to the cafeteria and into the cafeteria. So as they're trying to corral all the kindergarten kids from this early ed wing, um, 
rather than have them spill into this wide corridor and, and just all kind of take their own path there, the teachers can suggest, hey, why don't you follow the stream bed to the cafeteria? Um, so so that's, that's what we're hoping to achieve there. Once we get into the, the academic wing corridors and into the classrooms, we, we don't have the same kind of need for the abuse resistance that you do right coming in from the doors. So we're hoping to switch to a transition to a softer floor. Um, Again, still something that's going to be low maintenance for us. We're looking at linoleums that don't have to be waxed. It's softer underfoot um, if you're a teacher standing in the classroom all day. Um, and then rather than carpet, um, we found a product that's actually recycled plastic water bottles. And it looks and feels like carpet, but it's not carpet. It's a resilient floor. You can um, pretty much dump anything you want on it and just sponge it up. Um, apparently, it's a little bit. Um, tricky if it's dust. <laughs> I think you just vacuum it, but I don't know. Um, we, put a, we put a sample in Whitebrook already in their media center, and there were marks on it. I, sa I say that because there were marks on it. Um, we called our, we said, well, this doesn't look very good to our rep, and he went out and he figured out that it was just dust, and the most important thing about your floors on the project is when the building's turned over, your maintainers will be trained on how to take care of them. 90% um, of the buildings that we do and finish and get calls back on that the floors are having issues, it's because the maintenance isn't being done properly. And it's not the same maintenance that um, you do on floors in the buildings that are 50 or 100 years old. Uh, floor technology has come a long way, mm -hmm. and the maintenance and care of these floors has progressed as well. So it's really important that we get the right people in and that we're training the right people in the district to take care of them. Um, that's part of a commissioning process that you'll have for a number of systems in the building. Um, right down to your light switches. I think it, maybe in the high school, um, I remember complaints of, geez, we have to get trained on the light switches, and it's true. <laughs> I've seen the light switches that go into classrooms now, and um, multiple scenes, whether they're teaching or if they're doing an activity, there's, there's a lot of selections available. So, um, The other thing that's nice is, um, uh, one of the things, the luxury vinyl tile is like a wood plank look, so you can kind of have a, a warmer, again, looking finish in the building. And some of them come a long way as far as not looking like a plastic wood floor. Um, so, But we can use that material as an accent or a different color as an accent in the classroom. And what we'll do, uh, what we've done basically, is calculated, okay, well, if we've got a door with a window in it and a side like, like, like we've got on, on these doors that people can look in, um, if there is a lockdown scenario, where's the shelter in place? area of the classroom that um, you can't that can't be seen from the corridor through those those doors um, and that's what the accents kind of against the, the bottom corner of all the classrooms are and we like to do it as a floor finish because it's not screaming at you this is a shelter in, in place you know this is where you go in an emergency it's just something easy that if there is an emergency the teacher can quickly say okay everybody onto the wood floor and um, people will know that that's a safe zone in the school so and then just kind of summarizing the, the um, timeline for this. Um, as Tim mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna go out to bid this coming fall. Construction will start um, either late December, more likely early January for the project. It's a decent duration. Um, we recently built in a little bit of time, uh, pushing the move in for the, May, uh, the Whitebrook kids to um, January of 2022, rather than shooting for the fall of 2021. Um, while that gave us enough time, what it didn't take into account is um, all the unforeseens. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be delays in materials. Um, we don't know if we're going to have a really bad winter that's going to delay the contract. What we don't want to have happen is have no contingency plan in place, the building not be ready, and um, really, what are you going to do with um, staffing changes and everything? So we want to make sure that there was a little bit of cushion there um, for the unknowns, really, to protect, um, really protect the district. Um, from having, having to kind of deal with the chaos of that at the end. So we do have students moving into the middle school <coughs> January 2022, and then the rest of them showing up in the fall of 2022 to the completed project. So, any questions? It's <laughs> <laughs> exciting. It is. It's exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you, guys. Thank, right. thank you very much, both of you. I appreciate it. Sue, could you do the lights for us? Thank you.
Wow. Yeah. 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 All right. That's all I have. Okay, on to matters for action. Warrants and payroll. I move to approve the school payroll date of March 14, 2019, in the amount of $514,184.19. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I move to approve the school payroll dated April 11, 2019, in the amount of $525,926.12. Second. All those in favor? I move to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated April 11, 2019, in the amount of $171,972.30. Second. All those in favor? Minutes? I move to approve the minutes from our from our public hearing, um, FY 2020 budget, at 6 p.m. on March 26, 2019. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. All right. And then out-of-state field trip request. So we have... Um, Request from the Whitebrook Middle School to go to the Mystic Aquarium um, at a cost of $50 per student um, to be funded through students and students' families and a fundraiser. The educational purpose of this trip is to enjoy a fun, active learning investigation, specifically a squid dissection, mm -hmm. inspire scientific literacy and inquiry, and encourage students to think creatively, supporting Common Core learning. I would make a motion to accept this field trip request. Second. Any discussion? I do have a question. Does yes. anybody know if they still sleep on a ship? We did that when we went. Oh, that's, that's not, not like they haven't done thing. that in a long time. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they've done that. They haven't done that in years. years. <laughs> My kids did that. Wow, that sounds yeah. fun. But neither one of mine did. It was a blast. Just one. And then um, we also have a request from the East Hampton High School for April 25th. Hold on, we didn't vote on that, did, did we? No. Did we, we do didn't it? Vote. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we seconded. You sorry. asked yeah, for a all question, in favor. and then we didn't vote. Okay. All those in favor? Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. That's okay. Um, so this request comes from the high school for April 25th, also to go to the Mystic Marine Life Aquarium um, for the purpose of study of marine species and environment. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? <laughs> this meeting is ended.